Beautiful. Okay. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon um, for what should be a quite intense and very informative uh, event. Obviously, people are, we're all here to talk about how consultancies are winning more project business with artificial intelligence. And what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to layer thin veneers of uh, logic and images over people. I'm actually going to um, dive into very specifics and frameworks of um, how we've personally been working with people. And actually, this is this is more of a presentation of personal experience and learning over the last 24 months than it is hypotheticals. So my hope for this is that you'll take away from this presentation a lot of the experience that we've gained through hard fought work and be able to implement that yourself. Now, the, the start of that is obviously, who am I, who am I talking, et cetera. So my name is Greg Lawton. I'm the CEO of one of the two founders of Nodes and Links. My background is a decade spent in project management, project controls and project execution. Uh, before that, I was a physicist. After that, I've been a founder of an AI tech company for half a decade. And I spend the vast majority of my time working with consultancies around the world, focusing actually on how to increase share price and how to introduce new services that are higher value adding and therefore can be charged more, plus elements of cost reduction and risk reduction. So I'm heavily focused on value creation. Obviously, to start, I said I'm the CEO of a company called Nodes and Links. Well, what is Nodes and Links? Well, Nodes and Links is an AI schedule management platform. What we do is we automate workflows so that teams can focus on actually building better plans and executing projects. And at a very quick level, what we do is we save people time. That is really what AI is all about. AI is an automation technology and it saves time by automating tasks. We've got clients all over the world. I think we're in 22 countries now, I think was the last report that, that we got. And the specifics is our mission is to revolutionize the way that project experts create, communicate, and consume information on projects. To make that very real, this is the internal presentation that I give inside our company. Our job is to move from this, so that is acumen fuse, and that, so things like primavera risk analysis, to AI. So things like this, large language models that are actually trained on scheduling and project management principles that are intelligent enough to answer smart questions on the fly, just like this. Okay. So let's go to it into the story. Right, the first part of this entire endeavor is this. What do we want to optimize for? We're talking about uh, selling higher value services and winning more business. Okay, cool, so what? We need the so what above. I'm not going to answer this question now, but this is something I really want you to take and think about. Are we optimizing for share price or are we optimizing for dividends? Those are two very, very different things. They create different businesses. One of them creates a tech enabled consultant and the other creates a consultant-enabled tech. I'll show you at the end of this, this presentation why they're so different. I want you to bear that in mind, and we're going to come full circle around to this, and hopefully you'll be able to have a conversation with CFOs in your own company about the, these matters. But the mission today is to answer a simple sentence. How AI as a something creates new value that leads to business value. Business value is what I just talked about, about share price or dividend. New value is the services and the offerings. And then AI is a how. So what we're going to do is we're going to step through each of these components. And I'm going to give you the internal frameworks that we use in nodes and links to orient ourselves around these questions that have led us to develop services that are worth tens of millions today in clients around the world. So first question. AI, what is AI? I'm not going to do a, a long ramble on this. I've done plenty of presentations and there's plenty of material out there, but I'm going to give a very specific perspective. 
How has technology evolved since the dawn of humanity? Well, technology has evolved through the position of contrarian viewpoints. What I mean is this. What if we could preserve thought for thousands of years so that anyone around the world can understand a moment in time in our head? Paper. It was the advent of paper. What if I could communicate with any human across the world instantaneously? The internet. What if I didn't have to do all the thinking? Artificial intelligence. Every single technology that humanity has ever built is a progression of automation of human labor. To the point where all technology is about scaling human productivity. So for example, a hammer, I can put more nails in wood in an hour than you can with a fist. A net, a fishing net, I can catch more fish in an hour than you can with your bare hands. An engine, I can transport more material faster and further in an hour than you can carrying it with your hands. Artificial intelligence, I can produce more thought work in an hour than you can. Everything is about scaling productivity. And actually, the difference between a lot of historic technology, like fishing nets, hammers, engines, and artificial intelligence, is that all historic technologies automated muscle. Artificial intelligence is one of the few technologies that automates mind. Another technology, by the way, that automates mind is calculators. The abacus. There's been very few technologies that automate mind, most automate muscle. Okay, well, what does scaling human productivity mean? Well, I'm going to talk in a business context. This isn't going to be some hypothetical conversation. This is very, very specific. What does AI mean for business? Okay, very simply. Before AI, I have one person. One person can produce one unit of work. Very simple. With a, a technology that increases productive capacity, one person times that technology equals more units of work. So it's a multiplying factor. So here, a multiplying factor is 1.2. Why is it 1.2? Doesn't matter, it's an analogy. You can do. You can calculate this yourself. How, how much of a multiplying factor is a car? Well, if your objective is to drive to work, how long would it take you to walk to work? How long does it take you to drive to work? The difference is the multiplying factor of the car. You still need to get to work. So you are still involved in that process but a calm multiplies your effect. The same here. A person still needs to produce work. How fast can that person produce work? Now, this is AI version one. What happens when AI gets better? Well, it becomes more productive. It's a bigger multiplier. So for example, rather than just a, a singular answer, it can now give multiple answers to the point where actually, as you go across versions, the multiplying factor is an exponential increase. It's a power law increase. This applies to almost all technology. It's not just artificial intelligence. Take locomotion, what I talked about. First of all is sandals. Imagine not getting stones in your feet. Next of all is a horse. Next after that is a few horses, a chariot. Next after that would be the first car. Next after that is a more modern car. Next after that is a jet. You see how it starts to move up. It's the same with artificial intelligence. Now, within this domain, I've come up with a, an own personal equation. It's just a way of me trying to understand the world that I see. And my equation is this, that the productive capacity of, a, of a, an artificial intelligence system is equal to how advanced that system is, times by how tailored it is to a certain set of workflows divided by the difficulty of access. So let me explain the different components and why I think this. If an AI is far more advanced, by definition, it has greater capability. 
Therefore, it has more optionality to create productive capacity. The more tailored an AI is to the exact job that you need it to do, the more productive it can be at doing that exact job. This principle has been seen by humans for thousands of years. It's why I specifically focus on tech as opposed to farming in the fields outside. This is where I am tailored and I have detailed experience. I have no experience of farming. The other way around works. Farmers have a lot of experience, can produce a lot more crops than I could, but cannot do artificial intelligence and software development. The difficulty of access is a very big point because it's a dividing factor. If something is difficult to access, it almost doesn't matter how advanced the AI is or how tailored it is. The average person will not use it. But the easier it gets, it multiplies the above effect. And I'll give you an exact example of this. OpenAI. They released GPT in 2020. GPT that they that that they released, you know, GPT, the one that took off in 23, the core of all of that tech was available in 2020. What changed? They made it a web interface that you just type into. You didn't have to be a coder that understood Python and could send prompts on an API basis. You could be the average person and ask a question. Open AI's genius moment was making it easy to access. On the productive capacity equation, they nailed the top and then they got the bottom down to as close to zero as possible, which creates a power law effect. You can see this happening across every single industry. So in this, AI has the effect of having, it's a productive multiplier. Yeah. So how the question is, how does AI as a productive capacity multiplier create new value? Well, the next big question is, well, what is new value? What is value itself? And I want to be very, very specific here. So for a business like Nodes and Links, we sell technology. We don't sell cows. We don't sell consultancy. We don't sell insurance policies. We sell technology. And in the same way, consultancies sell services. You don't sell products. You don't sell cows. You don't sell whatever cars. You sell services. It's a very specific thing. So the question is, how do you create value selling services by leveraging AI that has the effect of increasing productive capacity? Well, we need to think about value. What is value in consultancy world? It's one of three things. And if you talk to any CFO in consultancy land, these are the three things they'll talk about. Value is being able to generate more revenue. The vast majority of the business models in consultancy land are bums on seats. It's a per hour kind of model. And the, the thing that unlocks the entire model working is winning business. Delivery of the business, I'm sure a lot of people will go, there's a lot of key points that we need to hit. Delivery of the business is almost a commodity because you can hire people. You can steal consultants from other companies. So execution is almost a commodity, but securing customers, that is the unique point. But because securing customers is the unique point, execution then becomes a very interesting play where in a lot of cases, a lot of consultancies want to decrease the amount of time it takes them to serve. So for example, if you could get a fixed price contract and you could decrease the time it takes to serve by 50%, you would move from an 18% margin to closer to 30%. That creates a very different business, a business with significantly less risk. And then talking about risk in consultancy line, the key risk is underutilization of people because tech can be scaled up and down in cost. Same as fuel. I either put the fuel in my car or I don't. I don't have to buy it. But when you're paying people a set wage every single month and you might not be getting money in every single month, that's the biggest risk in consultancy line. So... Obviously, there's a lot of underlying subtleties here, 
But really the core is, I talk at VP level and C-suite level, it's what are the things that materially move the needle for the business? Disproportionately winning more business, disproportionately decreasing the time it takes to satisfy that business, disproportionately decrease the risk of underutilization. Okay, so we can take those. Now, consultancies sell to clients. But what do they sell? Well, this is the next part is again, another pseudo equation. It's part of a bigger equation that um, I've got, which is uh, the perceived value equation within projects. But fundamentally within services, there are three components. There is work. So that is assessed on the volume and the quality. It's, it's the actual tangibleness itself. Then there's the intangibility, which is things like speed, accessibility, transparency, ease of dealing with people. It, it's how I like engaging with you and do I feel I'm getting a great service for what I'm paying? And then there's elements of commercial. And a lot of people don't uh, understand this, that actually the commercial terms are a large part of a value component that's put out. So things like guarantees on services around fixed price versus variable pricing, et cetera. These are the core three things. And actually, when we're looking at answering the question, how can AI as a productive capacity multiplier add new value? Well, the definition of new value is work, service, or commercial terms. So that's how we need to assess artificial intelligence. So with that said, that's what we're going to do. We're actually going to look at specific services that we've helped design in the industry that are live today with paying clients from uh, customers of nodes and links. So, you know, write these down if you want to sell them. The first one is smart delay analysis. So this is um, concurrent and non-concurrent delay analysis. This is not forensic delay analysis, it's the prequel. So forensic delay analysis occurs when a project is in delay and there's a dispute arising. So you'll hire consultancies like um, Hill International to come in specifically do analysis on that in a way that's geared for court. But it's best if you don't even end up in a claim scenario. And the workflows to be able to do that are to, to do, dependent on the contract, every time a change occurs to assess if there's a fault and to rectify it within the delay delay acceptance period, usually two weeks under an NEC4 contract. That takes a lot of work. Or an AI can automate the entire thing and give you the answer. That is what this is. So let's assess that based on the value creation. So work. I am getting the exact same result, but algorithmic, which means there are no, there is no possibility of human error. You can't accidentally add things up incorrectly. A slight value increase. And I say slight value because if I'm hiring a very good consultancy, I would expect them not to make mistakes. But you know, I'll, to not have that worry increases a little bit. To get an analysis very quickly on a potential delay or claim or litigation scenario, that is very valuable. Speed is the main value component in delay analysis. Very specifically, not running out of the two week window for having a discussion on acceptance of the uh, potential uh, delay proposition. So faster is more valuable. And then when it comes to commercial, what I have actually seen some people say is because they know that they can uh, do this so quickly now, they've actually just said, rather than uh, a price per hour, um, and actually rather than a price per assessment, because I've seen people do that, we'll just give you a guarantee. So we're not going to sell a consultancy service. We're going to sell an insurance contract. We will insure you that a claim will never go past the two week window without being assessed. So it's a, it's a commercial guarantee. 
Now, is a commercial guarantee more valuable than not having a commercial guarantee? Well, obviously, yes, it is, because then people are getting risk off their books. So having AI automate delay analysis in an incredibly fast way is more valuable than manually doing it slower with no guarantees. That's example one. And that is essentially the comparison between current, well, past and current. The next one is quantitative schedule risk analysis. So um, the process of, uh, there's two different versions of uh, quantitative schedule risk analysis, what I'll call a light version, which is a reiteration of settings that have been found out in a heavier version and the heavy version where you run workshops and you actually uh, get the team to propose uncertain distributions, risk activities, you run a Monte Carlo, you do your simulations, you, you pull out your tornado graphs and you go from there. Wonderful. Okay. But AI can look over vast amount of historic data and propose uncertainty distributions and risk events. And it can do it in two ways. One is the consultancy can leverage its unique position and compile a representative data set from which a historic benchmarking set can be developed. Is having benchmarks more valuable than not having benchmarks? Yes. It can also look inside a project if it's ongoing and assess what has actually occurred in terms of uncertainty and risk, and therefore uh, give ranges for assessments going forward. Is that more valuable than not having that? Of course it is. And within that entire mechanism, rather than just giving a P80, is having a triangulated P80 that has what the team thinks, what historics think, what the project's actualizing thinks, condensing on a specific number. Is that more valuable than just having a random answer? Of course it is. And at the same time, is it more valuable to be able to do this with less effort? So whereas as a consultancy, I would need to provide six weeks of service for this, I only need to do three weeks. So I'm selling something that's of higher value and it's costing me less to deliver. We're starting to see a trend here. Okay. The third, change analysis. It's very closely related to delay analysis in the cycle times that it needs to go, but change analysis. And this is effectively being able, and it's, it's, it's client organizations that are very, um, very attracted to change analysis. And essentially it's, I've got two schedules, what's different? And being able to assess that incredibly precisely and incredibly quickly, not only on an activity level, a, a relationship level, but on a path level and a KPI level. So I can instantly see all paths that have changed to all major milestones, milestone changes, trends over time, et cetera, like that. This one. Is it better to do this with less effort or more effort? It's better to do this with less effort. Is it better to have a governance control database that shows every change at every submission, every point in time, accessible by senior leadership? Yes, that's more valuable. It is more valuable to have a very controlled historic run of every single change accessible at any point in time. It's more valuable. And because it's instantaneous and so quick, can you provide guarantees? Yes, you can provide guarantees. So this actually works the same as delay analysis. And finally in this section, there's many of these by the way, but finally, Reporting. So in October last year, I actually stood up uh, at an event in the Gherkin that we held, and I actually announced three things. One was the release of large language models that automate generative, so it was generative reporting that automate report creation around some of the aspects that we talked about. The second is 
just to cause a bit of problems. Um, I announced the world's first fully AI powered project consultancy. And the product of that project consultancy was reports. So it was reports as a service, RAS. And rather than people buying, I want to buy a planner, I want to buy 1.5 FTEs, I want to buy this many hours. Rather than people buying inputs, the entire proposition was just buy the output, buy the report. So if you want a status update report, a predictability report, a risk report, you just buy the output so you know exactly what you're getting and it's a fixed price. Now, that actually got so much interest and so much demand that we actually had to turn it off right now because we're too busy delivering all of the reports that people came in and, and bought from us. But why am I telling everyone this? Well, again, it comes back to what we sell. I'm a tech company. I actually want to give all of that capability to consultants because long story short, I become a bigger business. That, that's really the, the not only short. If I give every consultancy in the world the ability to offer that kind of service, everyone wins and we win. So let's assess it like this. So AI powered report creation, you can generatively create reports from the data. Is it better to have tailored but standardized reports that are beautiful? and that have no human error? Yes. Well, that's only a small value increase on what we have today because people put a huge amount of effort in and the same argument as the first one. I, I employ uh, professionals and I expect them to do the job correctly. So a small value increase. Is the ability to standardize these across thousands of projects and have them produced with as little to zero effort better than bespoking them from every project and having people spend weeks and hours producing them every single time. Yes, this is cost reduction and standardization. And because of that, are people able to offer services like um, just pay for the report rather than the input? So it's value-based rather than input-based or guarantees. So can people say, I will guarantee that you will meet all of your contractual reporting requirements, and here's a fixed cost for doing that. And if you don't meet those contractual reporting requirements, I'll put as many people on the job until it is fixed. Now, that one is very interesting because in the current situation where people are paid by the hour, there's a disincentive to being efficient it is better if problems arise. So to a client, you're like, well, your, con your consultant earns more money if they actually do a pretty bad job. They just need to do not so bad that you fire them. Well, in this situation, you'll go, actually, I'm incentivized to do the most perfect job as efficiently as possible, because actually I earn the more, most money not having to come in and fix the problems. Those last two, so reports as a service, we've been selling that and actually there's some very large consultancies in the world that are actually launching that service the end of this month uh, globally. And there's a consultancy in America that we're working with, which has actually just launched the guaranteed reporting product. And the profit rates are unbelievable because of the of the risk reduction to the company. I'm talking here going from 18% to 70% profit rates with clients that are happier. So is smart reporting more valuable? Yes. So if we summarize all of those, well, what do existing services transform into? You've got delay analysis becomes AI powered. Risk analysis becomes AI powered. Change management becomes AI powered. Reporting becomes AI powered it can be proposed as a different system, okay? Now, how do you price these? Because that's a key element because we're talking here about creating business value, et cetera. And it's very simple. You price based on defensible value. And that's actually a, um, you know, if you go to, if you go to one of these executive MBAs and take a pricing course, that's, you know, core tenant number one. 
price based on defensible value. And you just need to ask yourselves these questions within the workflows and the services that you offer. Is getting something faster more valuable? Sometimes the answer is no, no, no one cares. Is getting a guarantee more valuable? Is getting something better, et cetera, et cetera? Is more transparency more valuable? Is more co consistency more valuable, et cetera? And this is exactly what we've seen. So for example, for AI enhanced QSRA, we've seen consultancies offer the normal service and then the AI service with a 50% markup on the per hours or the fixed cost that they're doing. Or because now it can be so fast, what they've said is rather than running one QSRA every single year and we'll come back next year to do it in your governance framework, really it's better to run it for every change in every governance procedure. So let's say 12 years, once a month. We'll do the whole effort up front to do the workshops, to do the Monte Carlos, to do the reports, the historic benchmarking, the actualized benchmarking, et cetera. And then what we'll do is we'll come in every single month and do it again. And we'll iterate and learn and give you warnings if anything major is changing. And we'll also do it for change requests, major change requests. And by the way, we're not going to charge you 12 times. We'll only charge you three times. The consultancy is earning three times the revenue, but because of the automations, they're actually, it's costing them the same. So in this situation, let's say you're at a 20% margin. So, um, you know, one, one element of productivity and you're making 0.2 on that goes to three elements of productivity. Now you're making 2.2. So you're getting closer to 70% margins on those. This is where we've really seen the best thinkers in the industry start to move. And this is why AI is so powerful because it enables people to charge more, to charge more frequently and to reduce costs. So there's a final component to this, which is how AI as a productive customer create business value it creates new value that leads to business value. So at the start of this presentation, I talked about, um, I talked specifically about, do you want share price? Do you want dividends? Okay. And I'm just going to give you some straight facts that you can just hit up Google now, go to Yahoo Finance and find them out. Not all money is the same color. Different money has different colors. And I'm talking here revenue and profit, not currencies. So not all dollars are equal. Consultancies, if you go, I had a look at this just before. If you go to AECOM, I believe in the last financial year, they made about 14 billion of revenues. Their current valuation is uh, roughly 12 billion. And their EBITDA was about 200, 250 million. So they, they made 14 billion and they're valued at 12. That is about a 0.8 multiplier, it's about 0.85. That is typical of consultancies. If you take a technology company, so take Microsoft or Palantir, Palantir is a great one because it's more focused. Or if you go to the Bessemer, uh, the Bessemer uh, SAS Cloud Index, which has all of the software companies as an index fund itself. So if you take Palantir, the revenue was around 2 billion. The value was 50 billion. The multiplier there is 25. Some people, some people for some reason, don't ask me why, are playing a game of I earn a dollar my share price is 0.85. And some people are paying the game of, I earn a dollar, my share price is 25. The average on the Bessemer Cloud Index right now, and we're in a bit of a market crash, is six times. So even in the cloud crash of 23 and 24, it is still six to 10 times more valuable than a consultancy business. That is the difference between manpower-driven consultancy, and technology. This has already happened in other industries. So does everyone, I want people to remember, do you remember 
when the major marketing companies did billboards and newspapers. Now they don't. Some of the biggest Goliaths in the world were built off taking marketing and making it digital. Digital marketing. The, the best digital marketing companies are valued at 20 times revenues because of their efficiency and their margins that they can produce. And they use platforms like Google, Meta, LinkedIn, etc., for their spending. And I'm going to leave you with this. This is my prediction on the future. Do you remember when project consultancy was about people? Do you, do you remember when it was all about people? How weird was that? How weird did, you know, we didn't have digital project consulting, we just had people consulting. That is where this industry is going now. And uh, to be fair, there's going to be very big winners. And you know, I, I said that you know, these kinds of conversations are really VP, C-suite, CFO level conversations about this conversation between share price and dividend. Because here's the thing, if you target share price, a normal consulting operation just cannot compete with you on price. Because let me run the numbers. So let's say, let's say that a consulting moves to a tech being a tech power consultant. Okay, their revenue, their valuation becomes 10 times revenues. Just for ease of math, let's say that normal consulting is one times. We know it's 0.85, but it, well, let's just say it's one. So each dollar is worth 10 times more. Okay, let's say my objective is to be twice as valuable as you. Easy. I just charge 20% of what you charge. So the number, you know, take 10, divide it by five. There you go. I am still worth twice as valuable than you. And I'm only charging a fifth of what you're charging. That is the world that we're about to walk into. So I'll, I'll leave with this, which is all of these systems are now moving from these on-premise 30 year old uh, people led systems to systems of intelligence that people utilize to vastly increase productive capacity to offer new services in the market, which people count as more valuable. And then very clever C-suite are figuring out how they position that for either a share price explosion or to create more cash flow. That was very intense. I hope people enjoyed that. If you would like uh, any more information, you can go online and, and check out nodes and links. If you want to try some of this tech, the AI tech, et cetera, you can create a free account. You can book a free demo. And if you'd like to reach out to me at all and ask any questions, my email's there. It's very simple. It's greg at noselinks.com. And other than that, I'll uh, open the floor to some questions if people have any. Thank you very much.